Every once in a while, you stumble across someone who defies categorization, who's led a thoroughly uncommon life. One such man is my dear friend Mikhail Mikhailovich Babrov. He's one of many interesting people I've gotten to know in Russia as I've explored the country with Viking. I first met Mikhail at the Hermitage when he was awarded a medal by the mayor who proclaimed him the most honored citizen of St. Petersburg, the city he so dearly loves. Over the years, Mikhail has grown to become a treasured member of the extended Viking family. And in sharing stories, I've come to have a much better understanding of the phrase, still waters run deep. Mikhail's gentle nature and humble personality provide few obvious clues to the man and his story. Born in St. Petersburg, then known as Petrograd, Mikhail's childhood seemed normal. But through those early years, he developed the unwavering resolve and sheer determination that later became the cornerstones of his character. As a young adult, Mikhail set his eyes beyond St. Petersburg and set out for the mountains where he soon discovered the power of a single journey to alter the course of a life. I took great interest in alpinism. It is a rather interesting story. I enjoyed alpine skiing, one-way city championship among young people, and I was awarded to this a tour to the Caucasus. Such beautiful scenery. That was the moment I lost my heart to the mountains. Right before the war, I went to the mountaineering camp. My instructors liked me, and they invited me to the school of instructors. So I finished that school and even stayed with them and managed to do some wonderful climbing. That's how I got these skills and made firm friends among mountain climbers. Mikhail relished every moment among the peaks and ledges, but could in no way imagine just how invaluable his newly mastered skills would become. All thoughts of mountaineering were swept aside in 1941 as the Germans rolled into Russia, three million strong. Mikhail felt compelled to serve. They did not want to take me because I was very young. I was just 17 years old. They told me, wait a year, don't hurry. You'll have time to fight. The elder boy said that I was a good, reliable guy. So finally, they took me. That's how my war life began. On September 8, 1941, one of the darkest chapters of the war began, as St. Petersburg, then known as Leningrad, was completely encircled by the Germans, under siege for 900 days. Warplanes and artillery struck the city with deadly accuracy. Nobody could understand what went on. When our agents got to the territory of the German artillery and kidnapped the officers from there. In their map cases, they found the pictures of Leningrad and all our tall dominant structures with gilded domes were indicated on them. All the objects were marked on the map with the reference in meters to this or that dominant building. And it was rather easy to bomb the city having this information. When they realized that our beautiful dominant buildings protrude the city, we had to hide them somehow. Leaders were perplexed on how to camouflage the towering icons until someone had an epiphany. Why not have alpinists scale them, then paint or cover the shining surfaces? In the abstract, the idea seemed simple, but in reality, the task was daunting. The most difficult was when climbing the spire of the fortress of Peter and Paul. We were very hungry, but we got only 125 grams of bread a day, so we had no strength. When you came to the ball, you needed to do the negative angle. There is nothing special about it, that's basic. But we were weak, hungry, and with the cold and wind, we could not do it. 
Mikhail paused, his heart racing. The only sound, the raspiness of his breathing in the bone-chilling wind. With but a moment's rest, he pressed on. So slowly, the last steps. I had several attempts, after which I managed to do it. Utter silence greeted him at the top, 120 meters above the city. A wave of relief overcame him before he set about attaching the vital ropes and pulleys. Finally, the process of camouflaging the Peter and Paul fortress could begin. At first we lived at home, but later we had no strength to go home. And we stayed where Peter the first son, Prince Alexei, his wife Charlotte and the sister for Peter the first Maria are buried. On those tombs we stayed. Put some wood boards with fell and arranged a stove pipe there. It was very warm. The team of four alpinists camouflaged structure after structure, each presenting its own set of challenges. This hindered the German offensive while saving cultural monuments and countless lives. For this, Mikhail and his team were rewarded for their courage and heroism. But more was asked of Mikhail Babrov before World War II had ended. Of all places, he was sent to the Caucasus Mountains, lands he so loved. What had once been a place of refuge between the peaks had become a place of unfathomable violence, a savage fight for country and freedom on skis. The truth is that the Germans were coming to the central passes of the Caucasus rather quickly, and regular military units could not fight in the mountains. They simply did not know how, and retreated. The 49th German Mountain Infantry Corps was approaching. They were very well prepared, the best alpinists of Germany. After battles in Austria, the Czech Republic and Norway, the German high mountain troops were battle-hardened, formidable adversaries, while Russian forces were woefully unprepared. There had been only two mountain rifle divisions that had practically nothing. They might have the hats, spiky shoes, ice axes and ropes, but that was it. They had no skills to work in the high mountains. To counter, Stalin scoured the far corners of Russia in search of the country's supreme alpinists, including Mikhail Babrov. That's why they gathered the mountain climbers, the real instructors from all the fronts. And they got in defense position from Mount Elbrus till Mount Kazbek, the most central passes of the Caucasus, where the fights were at 5,000 meters of height in the conditions of hypoxia, oxygen starvation. That was the winter of 1942-43. A single shot, shouting, a grenade could cause avalanche. Many of them. It was a very special war. Very few people know about it. It was a surreal time with days of mystical tranquility sprinkled in the midst of life and death struggles. Of the many battles, one remains vivid in Mikhail's thoughts to this day. No. They were coming down beautifully. They were wonderful downhill skiers. It was snowing at the beginning, and then the sun appeared. The atmosphere was far from warlike. When they were 100 meters away, we shot in the air and commanded, hand the hoch. Nothing. They started to shoot back. Our guys were chasing them, and the fight began. It was not long, only about 20 minutes, not longer. After the fight, we went to inspect the dead bodies, collect the documents and weapons. So we came up, and one of them was sitting. That was Otto Bauer. While it would have been easier to leave them behind, Mikhail and his team carefully moved the wounded Bauer and another German soldier down the mountains to have their injuries treated. Though the events of the day were quickly lost amongst other battles, the act of kindness was not forgotten. 
Years later, following the turbulent war years, a chance meeting at the 17th Olympic Games brought the two former enemies face to face once again. A group of Germans came and took their seats behind us. I looked back and saw this man, he waved to me. Who was that? Where could I have seen you? I asked him. He also spoke very good Russian. How do you know the language so well? Well, he said, the senior generation, we went to the front. You must have participated in the war as well. Yes, I was defending my Leningrad. No match again. So we went on and on, trying to unwind it. I was in captivity, he said. And where was that? That was on the 15th of February 1943 when we went in reconnaissance from Balkaria to Svanetia. We got into an ambush. I got wounded. I opened my mouth. Otto Bauer, is that you? And he said, Mikhail Bobrov? Oh my! So the two enemies met. We embraced each other. We talked and agreed that we need to raise the youth on sports fields, not on battlefields. In 1999, Mikhail Babrov put his mountaineering skills to work yet again as he joined an international group of adventurers. Their goal? Ski to the North Pole. Headed by Vitya Boyarsky, director of the Museum of the Arctic and the Antarctic, the group was filled with noted alpinists and polar explorers. Mikhail, upon reaching the pole, felt nothing short of sheer joy as he and the team planted the flag of his beloved home, St. Petersburg. And at age 75, he became the oldest man to ski to the North Pole, recognized by the Guinness Book of World Records. During the trip, we got the idea. It was right before the 300th anniversary of the city's foundation. In honor of this, we decided to put up the flag of the city on the highest mountains of the continents. Extreme weather caused cancellation of the Mount Everest attempt. However, Mikhail was with the team as they summited Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa, Europe's Mount Elbrus, and Mount Kastusho in Australia. We got along so well and were strong on each other. That was a wonderful time. Today, while life is quieter, Mikhail is climbing mountains of a different kind. He's the Dean of the Sports Department at the University and remains an active role model in society, all while continuing his prolific writing. Mikhail Babrov has also been bestowed with numerous awards, including, in 2012, the prestigious Ludwig Nobel Prize. I suspect that when I next visit Mikhail Mikhailovich Babrov, he'll have new challenges in his grasp and a sharp eye on the horizon, searching for his next adventure. Добро пожаловать в наш любимый город Санкт-Петербург. Браво! Браво!